All right, fluids, electrolytes. Um, so the dreaded hyponatremia algorithm. So um, for hyponatremia, the first thing you wanna do is check the osmolarity. So normal osmolarity is between 275 and 295. If they're mean, they won't give it to you. If they're nice, they'll give it to you. Well, if they're mean, you have to know how to calculate it. So it's two times sodium plus one eighteenth glucose plus one third BUN. That will give you the serum osmolarity. And you have to determine whether it's hyperosmolar, uh, isotonic, or hypotonic. So uh, above 295 in the middle or below 275. <clears throat> if it's high, then this is most likely caused by glucose. If it's isotonic, then this is called pseudohyponatremia, and it's most likely caused by protein or lipids. If it's low, this is where the majority of them fall under, then this, the next step is to check volume status. If they're hypervolemic, if they're euvolemic, or they're hypovolemic, and that's to t you can check by blood pressure and mucosa. To see if they're hypovolemic, they'll have dry mucosa and low blood pressure and so on. So if they're hi hypervolemic, the main causes are CHF cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome due to uh, systemic edema, and that's fluid overload. And then if it's normal volume, the two most common are SIADH and primary polydipsia. And if they're hypovolemic, the most common causes are diarrhea, vomiting, or um, diuretics. <clears throat> so after you've dis determined the volume status, right, then you wanna check the urine sodium. And the cutoff is 20. If it's above 20 or below 20, as a general rule, so the urine sodium is an indirect way of checking how good the kidneys are at how good the kidneys are at absorbing sodium. So if the urine sodium is low, that means you're absorbing sodium well. It's kind of like fina. Remember fina? If it's greater than two, then that's most likely intrinsic renal. But if it's less than one, then that's most likely pre-renal. Same concept. So if the urine sodium is high, then this is an intrinsic kidney disease. Whereas if it's the urine sodium is low, then the sodium is able to be reabsorbed. So you know the kidneys are good. It's got to be elsewhere. For example, let's start with if you are hypovolemic, right? Hypovolemic hypotonic hyponatremia and the urine sodium is high then this is most likely diuretics but if the urine sodium is low then this could be diarrhea or vomiting then uh if they are uh euvolemic right hypotonic hyponatremia you have to decide is this siadh or is this primary polydipsia well siadh right will have, um, since you're pulling in all the water, that will concentrate the sodium a lot, right? So sodium levels will be above 20, but primary polydipsia, it's dilute everywhere, even in the blood and the urine. So the urine sodium concentration will be really low. So the exception here is that in euvolemic hyponatremia, uh, hypotonic hyponatremia, that one you kind of have to use your logic. So the last example would be like a hypervolemic hypotonic hyponatremia. If the urine sodium is above 20, then you know this is some sort of uh, chronic kidney disease or acute kidney injury like acute tubular necrosis. But if the urine sodium is below 20, then think CHF, cirrhosis, or nephrotic syndrome. But as a general, and then the next thing is why you did, why it's important to diagnose this is it's important to also know how to treat these cases of hyponatremia and I'll try to make it as simple as possible and the, for hyponatremia it goes like this hypervolemic or hyp or euvolemic without symptoms hypovolemic without symptoms or hypovolemic with symptoms if they're hypervolemic or euvolemic without symptoms, the first thing you wanna do is water restriction. If they're hypovolemic and they have no symptoms, 
Then the next thing you want to do is normal saline. If they're hypovolemic with symptoms or if their sodium levels are below 120, which is severe hyponatremia, this is where you give hypertonic saline, which is 3%. So uh, symptoms of severe hyponatremia would be like lethargy and like co coma or like altered mental status. Then for hypernatremia, the algorithm goes like this. It's either euvolemic or hypervolemic, right? Hypovolemic, again, without symptoms or hypovolemic with symptoms. And so if the way I think about this is if someone has uh, hypernatremia, you want to water it down, right? But the problem is when you're watering down hypernatremia, you have to do it very gradually because remember high to low the brains will blow so if someone has hypervolemia or euvolemia right their uh, fluid body total body water is already like up to the brim right and their and their blood is very salty so you want to give basically free water because there's such a small amount of fluid volume left that you want to make as much of an impact as possible to water down that salt. So free water. But if they are hypovolemic, right, with no symptoms, then basically <clears throat> you want to give D5 half normal saline. And that's because just think of it in terms of gradients of the fluid replacement from being uh, least salty to most salty, right? So hypovolemic with no symptoms, right? Which is the middle one, is you're gonna give half normal saline. And the reason why the, the your fluid has a little bit more salt is because you need to replace more volume. And because there's so much volume you need to replace, it needs to be more gradual. Could you imagine if you filled this much up with only water, then that could be really dangerous. You could overshoot. So that's why you want to be more gentle with half normal saline versus the most severe form, which is if they're hypovolemic with symptoms, then that one is where you give a uh, completely normal saline. So half is around 0.45% saline, right? but normal saline is 0.9. So this is the saltiest of the three options. And so this one, if they have symptoms, you want to be able to give normal saline, which gives the most room to add as much fluid as possible while being as gentle as possible. So to recap, <clears throat> if you're hypervolemic or euvolemic, right, you want to just give free water. If you're hypovolemic without symptoms, then half normal saline. If you are hypovolemic with symptoms, the most severe one, then that's when you give normal saline. So remember that blood transfusions can cause hypocalcemia because the citrate in the packet will bind up all the calcium. And then this is a classic high yield too, is treatment of hypercalcemia. The first step is IV fluids. Treatment of hyperkalemia, the first thing you wanna do is uh, look at the EKG. If there's EKG changes, you wanna give calcium gluconate. That helps stabilize the cardiac membranes and pre helps prevent arrhythmias. You can also give insulin which pushes potassium into the cell but make sure to give glucose with it to keep you keep yourself euglycemic and chiaxalate also helps too which binds potassium in the gut and helps promote excretion of potassium so hypermagnesemia the first sign of hypermagnesemia is loss of deep tendon reflexes and you treat it with iv calcium gluconate which also stabilizes the cardiac membranes. Next is the parathyroid hormone axis. So remember that primary hyperparathyroidism, increased PTH, which, okay, so first, parathyroid hormone has three actions. One is it works on the bones directly, which increases calcium and phosphate release from the bone. The second thing it does is it will work on the kidney tubules it's itself and that will help increase calcium absorption and promote phosphate excretion 
So increased calcium, decreased phosphate. The last action of parathyroid hormone is it works on converting, helping convert calcidiol to calcitriol. And then calcitriol, yeah, and then calcitriol, which is vitamin D3, will then go to the gut and that helps increase calcium and phosphate uptake. And then you kind of, you know, all three sites have different uh, pluses and minuses, but at the end of the day, when you total it all up, the final balance is that high parathyroid hormone causes hypercalcemia and hypophosphatemia. So high PTH, high calcium, low phosphate, you treat hyperparathyroidism, primary hyperparathyroidism, with a, a parathyroidectomy. Um, also, the PTH access is there's a feedback loop too. And the two things that close the loop that cause negative feedback are high calcium levels and high vitamin D3 levels. So if vitamin D3 is high, boom, PTH will shut down. If calcium is high, boom, PTH will shut down as well. So <clears throat> this hormone axis is difficult, but once you get the hang of it, it's pretty fun. So next would be um, another scenario would be hypoparathyroidism. So low PTH will mean low calcium and high phosphate. Another situation is kidney failure. So if someone has kidney failure, this is getting more tricky. You have to remember that they're no longer able to convert calcidiol to calcitriol because that's a, a, one of the main functions of the kidney. <clears throat> so they aren't able to absorb calcium and phosphate from the gut. Also, the kidney tubules don't work, so they have low calcium, they can't absorb calcium, but they can't dump phosphate either. So phosphate will be locked up in the body, and then basically, uh, PT and then uh, actions on the bone will try to increase phosphate and calcium. But at the end of the day, when you total everything all up, uh, kidney failure will result in elevated PTH, but low calcium and high phosphate. Why? Because uh, the phosphate is unable to be excreted and the PTH levels aren't high enough to overcome the deficiencies of uh, the, the kidney and the gut from absorbing calcium. Kidney failure will be high PTH, low calcium, high phosphate. And then there's vi vitamin D deficiency, which can be just an isolated problem, which is due, can be due to nutritional uh, deficiencies or malabsorption, like in celiac disease or people with pancreatic cancer or cystic fibrosis or sunlight deficiency. These people will have low vitamin D3, and then because of that, they won't be able to absorb um, calcium and phosphorus from the uh, gut, and then uh, these people will have a total of low calcium, low phosphorus, and high PTH, because when they have low calcium and low phosphorus, the PTH will turn on, and then it'll try to uh, absorb more calcium, but it'll also dump out more PTH, so PTH will go even lower. And then remember that the main source of increasing calcium levels is the gut. So basically, people who have uh, vitamin D deficiency will have low everything, and then the PTH will turn on to try and compensate for that but it'll usually still stay very low. The last is squamous cell uh, cancer of the lung. Remember, it can make PTHRP, parathyroid hormone releasing related peptide. And then this acts exactly the same like parathyroid hormone. So it'll increase calcium and decrease phosphate. And then remember, since the calcium levels will be so high all the time, that will feed back on the actual PTH and then the P actual PTH levels will be low. So this will cause high calcium, low phosphate, low PTH, and high PTHRP.
<clears throat> so remember for mechanical ventilation settings, PCO2 is controlled by tidal volume and respiratory rate, whereas PaO2 is determined by FiO2 and PEEP. So basically, a patient who's mechanically ventilated, they'll give you the ABGs, they'll give you the pH if it's alkalotic or acidotic, and they'll give you the PCO2 and the PaO2, and say, and then you have to know what kind of adjustments to make, like, uh, uh, if the PCO2 is too high, right, so they're hypoventilating, then you want to increase ventilation and the parameters you can change are tidal volume or respiratory rate. So if you increase both of those, the patient will blow out CO2 more and vice versa. Whereas uh, if they have hypoxemia, low PaO2, then you can increase PEEP or FiO2 to help increase the oxygen levels and vice versa. That's a classic question they like to ask too. So <clears throat> in summary, acid base, first thing you wanna do is check the pH. If it's between 7.35 and 4.5, that's normal. Below that is acidotic, above that is alkalotic. That's the first step. The second step is to look at CO2 and bicarb. So CO2 is normal between 35 to 45, and bicarb is normal from 22 to 28. And then remember that low bicarb equals acidosis, high bicarb equals alkalosis. Low CO2 equals alkalosis, high CO2 equals acidosis. So the first thing, look at the pH. If it's low, you know it's an acidosis, you have to determine what is the culprit? It can either be bicarb or CO2. One of them will be in the range that will be acidotic or will be acidotic. <clears throat> if it's high CO2, boom, you got it. It's the first thing is it's a respiratory acidosis. Look at the bicarb next, right? And determine, and then the bicarb tells you is the metabolic side of the pH, right? There's a respiratory arm, which is the CO2, and then the metabolic arm, which is based on bicarb. And then you, and then you uh, determine whether that's acidotic or alkalotic. If it's acidotic, then that's mixed, respiratory acidosis and metabolic acidosis. If it's alkalotic, then you know that's compensation because it disagrees with the pH. That's kind of just a rough overview of how to calculate acid base, but say you have to know the next best step. So if you calculate a metabolic acidosis, which means a pH below 7.35, right? And a bicarb that is below 22, right? The next best step is to calculate the anion gap sodium minus chloride minus bark bicarb. If it's greater than 16, right, then that's an anion gap metabolic acidosis. Then you think of your mud pile as mnemonic. If it's below that, it's non-anion gap, and the two most common causes are RTA or diarrhea. And then RTA can be one, two, or four, which I talked about earlier. And then the next is metabolic alkalosis. So if it's metabolic alkalosis, which means that the pH is above 7.45 and the bicarb is above 28, <clears throat> then the next best step is you wanna check the urine chloride. If the urine chloride is high, above 20, then this is a renal problem. If it's low, then this will be a GI problem. And then remember that if you wanna get more detailed, if someone has a metabolic acidosis that's non-anion gap, how can you tell if this is a RTA problem or a diarrhea? Is you can calculate the uh, urine anion gap. So basically, that's sodium plus potassium minus chloride. If it is negative, negative, right, G-U-T, then this is a GI loss. If it's positive, then that is a kidney loss, so most likely renal tubular acidosis. And that is electrolytes.